Welcome to AppCenter, the show which talks about the technology projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane, and today I'm speaking with Sergey Gorbunov. He's the co-founder of Axelar. Axelar is one of the leading interoperability protocols, like aiming to kind of uh, make all of the blockchains interoperable or, or lots of them, lots of different diverse proto uh, protocols. Very cool project, so I'm really excited to, to dive into that with Sergey. Now, before we do that, uh, let's briefly go through our sponsors. So we have, first of all, Paraswap. So Paraswap is a DEX aggregator on Ethereum. So that means through Paraswap, you can access liquidity on various different decentralized exchanges. So the protocol automatically finds the cheapest source of liquidity for you. And you know you can get the best price. It's also very gas friendly, so it keeps your transaction costs low. They also added support recently for different EVM networks like Avalanche, Polygon, BSC, and Phantom. And you can also use it directly from your Ledger Live. And also they've started a kind of DAO. So if you want to get involved in that, you can do that with their PSP token. Yeah, so go check that out at Parasop.io. And then second sponsor, Course One. So proof of stakes becoming like a major way of securing decentralized networks, lots of different ones, including the one we're going to speak about today, Axelar. So Cores One is running staking infrastructure on lots of different networks, allowing you to earn rewards and contribute to network security and doing so in a secure way. So it's with billions of people staked on, you know, around 30 different networks and uh, also supporting institutions in participating in the staking economy through, you know, white label nodes. So yeah, if you're interested uh, in staking, head over to chorus.one and start your staking journey there. And then before we get started, one more thing. So my wife has started a podcast. Uh, it's called Non-Conventional and it's uh, really great. They have uh, guests across like lots of different domain. I was a guest on there. I think there's some other crypto episodes too, but it's like all kinds of things. Also like entrepreneurship, art, science, etc. So you can go and check it out and let me know what you think. So you can find it on nonconventional.show. And so with that, let's get started. Uh, Sergey, it's so great to have you finally on Epicenter. Hey, Brian, good to be here. Pretty excited. This is like, I have the question of what here is like directly in, but maybe you can t like take a step back a little bit. Like, how did you, how did you become interested in, you know, crypto and blockchain? Yeah. So, you know, I think my background, I played with various technologies. I think over the years, uh, originally I worked in the kind of software defined networking and uh, just distributed systems. Um, and then I wanted to um, go to grad school to study formal cryptography, right? So I ended up going to MIT to work on theoretical cryptography for a number of years, um, including, you know, lattice-based cryptography, like functional encryption, like multi-party computation protocols and things like that. And then, you know, by the end of the grad school, um, kind of solved a few interesting problems. I knew that, uh, you know, I had enough to uh, defend my thesis, but um, got a little bit bored, right? And was looking for a new space and a new uh, uh, set of problems to work on. And so that's how we started to look at the at the blockchains and crypto. That was around 2014, 2015, kind of pretty early days. Um, you know, Ethereum was still in the early makings and they were figuring out some of the scalability issues. And um, I started to collaborate with uh, Silva Michali, who was a faculty at MIT at the time on some of the early designs behind the Outground protocol. And, um, you know, 2015, I finished um, grad school. I went to the University of uh, Waterloo for a few years, continued doing research there in systems, um, you know, crypto security. Um, and then after that, been kind of joined the, the crypto space full time, right, and helped to build out grant. Uh, we took that to the market, uh, you know, two and a half years ago. And um, since then, yeah, it's been kind of full time. It's, uh, it's an amazing space to be in. I'm pretty excited to build here. Yeah, absolutely. It is a pretty, pretty unique industry. I, I don't think there's anything like it. For, at least I've not heard of anything like that. So no. one thing I'm curious about, so with Algorand, right, you, you were part of, uh, you know, like a big blockchain project, right, big layer one 
uh, project. Now, then you went to start Axlar, like your own project. So I'm curious, like, what are the main lessons or learnings that you had from like your time at Algorand that you were like, okay, that's something, you know, definitely want to do differently, or that's like something that's like really important in terms of how you approach launching, uh, you know, uh, crypto protocol. Yeah, great question. I mean, I think a, you know, it, it, it is important to say that the time it is probably, you know, a little bit different at, right now than when it was when we we're launching our grant. So, you know, some of the things that I say, uh, you know, should be revisited. Right. Um, but I think that being said, uh, at least building right now over the last few years, I kind of realized that building alongside the community is probably, you know, one of the most important things. Right. So that as you're making decisions, as you're building a network, right, where you have lots of actors participating in it, like validators, right? You have users, you have applications that will be interacting with it. Um, I think getting feedback early, getting, you know, re reacting to the feedback, iterating quickly, um, allowing people to, you know, contribute and participate and build on side with you, hear their ideas is, is, is kind of quite fundamental, right? And I, and I think this is Right now, that, that to me, to me, that's been one of the most rewarding things. I think building in crypto space and building, you know, an open network is that, um, you know, we have a core team that that does a lot of development. But um, I think without the external support of, you know, folks like uh, like you guys, Chorus One, right, and, and other validators and other community members building like dashboards and tools and monitoring services, um, I think it would be a lot harder to to get where we are. So and. Um, we're trying to leverage that, I guess, to the fullest extent. <laughs> What's your secret to like building the Axlar community? What, what has worked best? I mean, I'm not sure if there is, you know, a, a specific one secret, but I think um, being transparent, right? Being open and where we are, you know, listening to feedback, inviting people. Um, and I think, you know, it's important to help each other out, right? As we're building this, there's a lot of folks that are Kind of get into the space trying to learn how to um you know set up nodes or how to perform simple transactions across networks and things like that and uh, just listening to that um providing feedback along the side i think that's you know that that worked quite well with us i think the other things that we have done well is we're running a lot of different um community programs where where we try to structure how people engage with axler right so that uh, we've been running this uh, quantum community program over the last um over the last uh, few months and uh, kind of Kate, uh, who is working on our community development, has been doing a lot of driving behind it. And there we allow kind of non-technical people to participate, right? Which is something have, people have asked for a lot, which is like, how do I create content? Like, what type of content do you guys need? How do I create documentation? Like technical write-ups about Axelar, like how to explain it better? Um, and things like that. And so, you know, we, we, we try to put some structure and, and give them some ideas how to, um, how to get engaged. And, and I think that, that that worked quite well. Let's take uh, maybe step back around Axelar. So what was, what was the original impetus? Like, why did you want to start this project? And what, what's your vision for Axelar? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think as we were building Algorand and taking it to the market, I think a um, we quickly realized that a lot of other you know platforms are being built uh, in parallel that are going to have traction, that are going to have use cases, and you know maybe optimized for different constraints that like Algorand was optimized for, for instance. Um, you know, some of them build their own different software stack, some of them just target different markets, and so definitely we quickly saw that many ecosystems would continue to evolve in the space, right? Um, now, when you take that as a, you know, as a given, then the first question that asks, well, how do you interact across those ecosystems, right? Uh, for us, the first ecosystems we wanted to interact with from our grant were Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? And I think every, every proof of stake blockchain that was built around the same time frame had a similar question, like how do you connect to those two networks? But, uh, you know, that on its own, you know, you can think about like bridges or some 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 type of a one off solution and, and sort of that's fine. But um, if you take as an assumption that many other ecosystems are going to continue being built, continue being developed, 
then you ask yourself a question, well, how do you make it easier to connect all of them together? What are the universal metrics that you have to satisfy at the protocol layer, at the infrastructure layer to connect them together? Um, and so that's what we started to do. And the end goal for Axler has always been to you know, allow users and developers to interact with all of these ecosystems in an easy way, right? I see an application, I have an asset, I should be able to go and use that application with my asset, which is not, not really possible if you have to hop across from one network to another, you know, in, in, in some fashion. So if, if you see in the end, like if you see sort of Axlar or interoperability in the long run, do you think we're going to have like lots of different interoperability protocols? Or do you think there is going to be like a convergence on, you know, one or two? Great question. So um, I think there's going to be different protocols, but different protocols are going to be across different layers of the stack. Okay. So if you take as an analogy, you know, how the internet works, right? Interoperability protocols are all about, you know, how the internet is structured, right? And it's not a single protocol. It's kind of a sets of protocols that were built everything from, you know, routing protocols, um, transmission protocols, application layer protocols. Um, on some of the layers, you have few protocols, you know, on the core routing infrastructure layer, you have protocols like IP, uh, BGP, right? Um, then you have TCP and UDP protocols on top of it. But then you have many application layer protocols that are making it easy for the applications to interact and kind of talk to one another, right? Um, and at least right now, I would think that something similar will happen in the blockchain ecosystem where at the core, you know, routing or infrastructure layer will probably get end up with, I think a handful of solutions, right? Or maybe protocols. Um, and then on top of it, I expect to see a lot more application layer protocols that, you know, leverage all of the core infrastructure to communicate and go back and forth. Um, and that's what, you know, applications would be exposed with. But on the network and routing layer, you know, I don't think um, we cannot scale if there's just too many protocols, right? This the system can, is going to continue to be fragmented. So I do think there's going to be, a, you know, a convergence towards a few approaches or a few, you know, message formats in some sense. When you were pursuing that, or like, you know, kind of started working on this, on this idea of like having this interoperability solution, what did you feel like was, I mean, what were the main kind of requirements that you had for like the solutions that were produced? Like what were you trying to optimize for? Yeah. So I think first requirement that we had was to be able to connect with the, with any ecosystem in an easy way. Right. So meaning that in the blockchain space, we've seen lots of different consensus protocols, right? Um, everything from proof of work to proof of stake, they all have different finality rules. They all have uh, their way uh, of dealing with, uh, you know, safety and liveness thresholds and so on and so forth. And so we wanted to be able to plug in uh, in an easy way with any of the ecosystems without having to make, you know, complicated engineering, um, you know, projects and kind of spend years integrating one platform to another. So that was a, you know, first core requirement. Um, I think the, the second core requirement was to be able to um, translate, right, and route across any of these ecosystems in an easy way. So, so I think, you know, um, the basic problem that comes up as you connect more and more of these ecosystems is that A, they all speak very different formats and different languages, right? So you need a mechanism to be able to, you know, take a message from one chain, be able to translate it and put it uh, as a message on a different chain. Um, and you need to be able to route it in an effective way, right? Um, like how do you make sure that as new ecosystems are being added, there is no additional like latencies or, you know, hops that are introduced to, to connect to those ecosystems. So those were some of the core requirements that we, um, that we wanted to make sure we can satisfy. And the final one was to um, really think about it. How do we make it easy for the users to interact with all of these uh, solutions, right? I think we are still so early at the interoperability space where we're talking about, you know, core pipes and infrastructure, but we do have to get to a level where, you know, applications integrate with this infrastructure so that 
the users can go and just use the application that they that they want across the ecosystem. And so building a stack that would allow for that user experience is actually quite fundamental and, and quite important. And you know, we spend a lot of time thinking how to make those um, you know, those design decisions that would down the line optimize for this user experience and make it easier for the users to uh, to talk to all of these chains. Cool. And, and so can you describe the, you know, what's the architecture that you ended up arriving at? Like what does Arxlr look like on a high level? Yeah, so on a high level, you know, Axler is a, a proof of stake network that's built around Cosmos SDK. Right. And what it runs is that it runs a uh, kind of cross chain uh, consensus protocol that we have built. Um, and um, what happens under the hood is that a set of validators are collectively monitoring different blockchains and they're monitoring special exit points on those blockchains. Right. We call them actual gateways. So think of a gateway as a special account or a set of accounts or a smart contract. If you're talking about, um, you know, a smart contract compatible chain, information can come into this gateway account. The validators collectively reach a decision of what needs to happen with that information, right? Where it needs to go, where it needs to be routed or translated along the way. They perform those functions collectively. Uh, they vote on it and then they produce a message uh, that can be posted on the destination chain and that message then gets executed, right? Um, and so the basic idea is then you have this Axler consensus protocol and the validators that are executing all these cross-chain functions. Um, you can onboard more chains, um, you know, more validators can join. It's an open network. Um, you can keep on adding more protocols and you get all the benefits of having this, you know, universal overlay network across all of the all of the blockchains that does all the core functions. Right. And, and just to, to maybe kind of contrast this a little, like, like one, one interoperability solution that people may be aware of is, uh, you know, something called IBC, right. Which exists in Cosmos and in IBC basically you have like, okay, let's say Cosmos hub and osmosis and you have a light client of the Cosmos hub running in osmosis and the light client of osmosis running the Cosmos hub. Or, you know, the, the, these light client proofs are basically accepted. And then you can connect this way. Now, of course, the problem is that doesn't really, like, work easily across, like, lots of different chains, right? For example, like, how is the Bitcoin chain going to, like, verify uh, light client proofs some some other chain? So then here you basically, you have a set of operators, you know, that are, like, running full nodes that you then trust. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I guess, yeah, like, you know, what you mentioned is, is quite correct, right? Like I think IBC is a, you know, great protocol and I think it works really well. Um, but it wasn't an, a very heavy engineering undertaking, right? Even for Tendermint based chains to, you know, integrate and implement. Integrating for some other chains, even proof of stake chains, like, like Algorand or Avalanche, I mean, a lot of the stack would have to be rebuilt to do that, right? Which is, um, you know, kind of would be years of work and, and engineering. And so um, I think that's one thing. And two, you are always going to be in the need of maintaining these light clients and these connections, right? If you create IBC connections. So if I'm upgrading my proof of stake blockchain and I'm modifying consensus because I have a better algorithm or I want to change the way I'm, you know, creating blocks or headers, that means all of the connections that I need to manage uh, as an operator of this network, um, I would have to go and write the light clients for them. They may have to be produced in different languages like Solidity, you know, Rust, um, Consensus Layer, whatever that is. I have to go and upgrade them, uh, maintain them, and so on and so forth. So I think we, we try to optimize a little bit more for engineering ease of use and onboarding uh, in some sense than um, I would say kind of a, I know IBC is almost like, uh, you know, the, the ideal model, but it's, uh, you know, but it's, but it's very hard to scale in practice. And, um, if you're talking about diverse ecosystems. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the security aspect of interoperability, right? I mean, I think we have seen some of the biggest hacks and, and sort of misfortunes have happened around interoperability. I think there was something on Ethereum 
I don't remember what it was called now, but that was like a few months ago. That was like a really huge one. And then of course we've had wormhole more recently. Like why is the security of interoperability in your view? Why is this so hard? Yeah, no, great question. Be at the very core, kind of any interoperability protocol works as follows, right? You, you need to, you have, let's say you have two, two blockchains, right? On the very high level, any blockchain is a, is a database plus a network, right? So let's think of it as a database. So your goal is to get to synchronize two databases in some sense. Right. So what is the way of synchronizing a state across two databases? Well, the most standard approach is that, you know, you lock a state on a source chain, you replicate it on a destination chain. Right. So whenever you're talking about moving assets across different blockchains, most of them effectively uh, lock the state on the source chain of an asset. Um, and then you replicate the state on the destination chain and the destination chain can work with that state and then you go back and forth, right? So it's a similar how, you know, on the internet, we're doing messages across different systems where, you know, um, a message is sent, you can put databases, you know, you can lock information in one database or another, you can manipulate it and so on and so forth. So that effectively creates a big um, challenge is that how, when you lock the state on the source chain, how do you make sure the nobody can unlock it right without being authorized uh, without getting authorization to unlock and um you know in in ibc for instance model what allows you to surf lock or unlock are these proofs right that you pass around from um kind of source chain to destination chain and that proofs allows you to verify that information uh, on a different chain has entered a certain format and therefore it can now be manipulated on this uh, destination chain, right? Uh, with uh, most interoperability protocol, that's similar way. It's the question is, what is this proof? The question is, how compact is the proof? How easy it is to generate it? And so on and so forth. Um, and because a lot of these interoperability protocols are built across many complicated software stacks is just non-trivial to, to do this uh, to do this the right way. But I would say that it's a kind of a no different than, well, it is different, but it is very similar to how we were just learning how to build, let's say like different DeFi applications in a secure way three years ago, right? I mean, I think you remember, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, um, lots of applications were shipped. Uh, people were just experimenting, locking, you know, millions or hundreds of millions of dollars of liquidity. There were some attacks where, well, some chains even decided to to fork, right, <laughs> to prevent, uh, to uh, kind of resolve the the incidents. Um, but uh, it was the same problem that people just didn't know how to do it securely. People didn't pay attention to the audits, right? Uh, people were still learning the, kind of the edge cases of some of these uh, software programming models. With interoperability, you're talking about a much more complicated problem um, where you're talking about different many different ecosystems. You have to you know create those proofs in an efficient way. You have to relay them. But you know I do think it's a solvable problem. You just have to be much more thoughtful how you think about security, how you think about audits, uh, you know, emergency mechanisms and, and so on and so forth. It's a full stack that you really have to sort of embrace if you're actually trying to solve this. And do you think there is, you know, kind of like a fundamental difference in sort of the level of security between, you know, like this kind of light client based approach versus approach where, you know, you have basically a set of operators who run full nodes on, on each chain and sort of observe the state. I mean, there are definitely, you know, differences if you look at, uh, you know, kind of a one connection at a time, right? But I think if you look at the ecosystem from a broader perspective, then you kind of realize the following. Um, a, suppose we're going to be in a world with hundreds of thousands of chains, okay? Which, okay, not even an assumption anymore, right? I think we're definitely going to be in a world with, with hundreds of useful chains, um, maybe thousands down the line. Um, in that model, you cannot have pairwise connections across every single chain, period, right? Because then every chain will have to manage, you know, a hundred other connections, you know, you're going to need to have, uh, you know, almost n square connections across all of these chains, who's going to manage them, who's going to figure, you know, update all the whatever protocols like clients deal with emergencies and so on and so forth. So no matter what, I think if you're in a world with many different chains, then you're going to have to 
trust some intermediary you know hubs along the way that will route your information right and whenever you trust in some intermediary hub to route some information through whatever protocol you're going to be trusting you know the validator set of that hub and on the internet as an example um we are you know on average taking like six or seven paths um across any different network when we send the packet Right. And so, the, you know, if you were to replicate it to the, um, you know, to the blockchain ecosystem, imagine taking six paths, which I don't think we should, by the way, I think we should try to minimize the number of, of, of hops, you know, we'll go from any two blockchains for this reason is that every time you would take a hop, you're going to have to trust, you know, uh, another set of protocol or another sets of assumptions along the way. So it, it's inevitable that you're going to have to trust some intermediary unless you're big enough to manage, you know, hundreds of thousands of connections yourself, right? Which nobody wants to do. So, um, so I think that's not really, you know, an issue. Uh, you would rather trust actually somebody who can do a diligent job of of being this sort of security provider for you, right? And being this hub that can, um, you know, securely connect you with hundreds of different chains, and so that you know that if something goes wrong, um, this network provider um, knows how to deal with it. Right. And has the operations in place, has the protocols in place to deal with emergencies, you know, uh, and um, react to it. I think that's one thing. I think the second thing, which is, I think, quite important to note is that most blockchains today run across the same validator set. Right. <laughs> um, you know, it's a kind of chorus, right? Figment, you know, I can, I can name, you know, a couple dozen validator sets and, uh, you know, a lot of them have the majority of the stake on, on most of these protocols. And so whenever you're talking about, you know, trusting this network or that network, um, at the end of the day, you trust in the validators and most of the time you trust in, you know, the same validators. So, um, you know, I hope we'll continue decentralizing. Um, for right now, it's not even a problem of, kind of how many nodes a protocol can support. It's more about how much we can decentralize the stake in some sense, right? Um, while still while still making it economically attractive for the validators to continue operating the networks. So I think that's actually a bigger challenge than, um, you know, how many nodes your protocol can support at this point. Yeah. And then, of course, one of the interesting aspects of like, uh, you know, I remember in the in the past, I, I don't hear this argument so much anymore, but you know, people were often saying like, oh, in Cosmos, like, how is it going to be safe and secure? Because like, you have so many different chains and, you know, is the market cap enough and things like that. But then like it, it, of course we haven't seen, right? Like in, in Ethereum classic, we had this thing where like you had the majority of the mining power basically do this 51% attack and like roll back the chain. Well, this has not happened in a proof of stake chain and like, okay, why not? I mean, I guess various reasons, right? First of all, like it's economically, it's just like so much more expensive. It just doesn't make any sense to basically ever do that. But then I think you also have the factor, right? That now, okay, you have all these different validators and if they did something malicious on one chain, well, they would like totally ruin their whole business on like all the chains, right? So. I think it means that even smaller chains, right, can be pretty, uh, you, you have this kind of like additional trust through, you know, reputation and, and in, in a way like the aggregate stake that's with them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm totally with you, that, right? And I think the only thing that we have worked to protect the ecosystem has been to try to maximize decentralization, right? Um, you know. It's still, I would say, not sufficiently, you know, decentralized yet. I think we we'll have to continue working and getting, you know, more validators kind of included in these sets and having them, uh, you know, giving them enough voting power and things like that. Uh, but, but like you said, that's the only thing that has kind of proven to work, right? Where um, you have dozens or maybe hundreds of, of different actors and. Uh, coordinating between them like an attack, which we all know who they are, right? Like they all <laughs> put their labels and you know uh, websites. Uh, so um, and I, and and I think just a huge credit, I think uh, you know, to all the validators communities on that because I think they have powered a lot of what we're seeing in the blockchain uh, ecosystem today. Let's dive into a bit more. So for so far, right, interoperability in crypto has mostly been around token transfer, right? Like you have, you know, Bitcoin and you want to put it into DeFi. So now we're going to use like I don't know, WBTC or 
you know, you have in Cosmos, you have like different tokens and you want to put them on osmosis, uh, you know, you want to put atoms in like liquidity pool on osmosis or like, what, what do you think are the use cases like beyond token transfer that you think are most exciting? Yeah, so, you know, I think there's a lot, right? That Like, I think token transfers in some sense is just uh, kind of a need. And that's why we've seen a lot of interoperability being centered around it. But um, more generally, you can just ask, can a user, you know, directly interact with an application with the tokens that they have on a different chain, right? Uh, and interaction with an application may or may not involve the token transfer, but it often involves like other information that needs to be passed along, right? So let me give you like an example. So suppose you have, you know, a stable coin like UST on a Cosmos chain, right? On Terra, right? And then as a user, you want to get directly, let's say ETH on the Ethereum chain, right? Uh, so the ideal user experience from a user perspective is then just going to their wallet, right? You know, making a one-click transaction where their tokens if needs to be routed across from, you know, Terra blockchain to Ethereum, swapped on the destination chain for ETH, and then the user receives ETH right away in their wallet, right? So this is sort of one-click experience where a token transfer is augmented with some other information the user, um, the user may include, like, um, what is the destination address where they need to receive the token? What is, I don't know, the slippage that they're willing to toler tolerate during this exchange and so on and so forth, right? Um, so I guess going beyond tokens, what we're asking is that can the users and applications compose with one another across these ecosystems, right? And that often requires passing messages um, like, you know, slippage information, whatever exchange rate that you like to take, um, amount, you know, your source, destination addresses that you want to communicate across and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that's, you know, just a layer above, I would say, you know, the token transfers, which is still mostly to uh, still uh, centered around token transfer use case. I think from there, um, sort of the sky is the limit in some sense, right? Any, any asset that's being created like NFT will effectively need interoperability because users want to um, interact with those assets across different ecosystems. And finally, the applications want to interact with one another and compose, right? Today, if you're building on top of Ethereum, you are taking interoperability for granted, right? But the, the reason that we're seeing DeFi and, you know, Ethereum or other uh, proof of stake blockchains emerge is because they allow developers to talk to one another, right? On the same blockchain, they can execute, you know, function calls, they can perform swaps one another and so on and so forth. Um, and so that's what we want to enable across different blockchains, right? Where applications can talk to one another, uh, send information, um, pull, you know, rewards, uh, incentives, uh, liquidity, mining um, rewards, and so on and so forth. And you know, I, I do think it's important to understand that that model, we're going to have to change the way the development is done a little bit. Um, you know, and we can talk more about that, but it, it is a new programming model in some sense and, and developers will have to embrace it. But I think it's sort of inevitable that I think it, it is going to happen. Yeah, let's go get into that because that was one of the topic I wanted to discuss with you. So has often been brought up as, you know, one of the core you know, strengths of Ethereum and, you know, the advantage of Ethereum over, let's say something like the Cosmos ecosystem where, okay, you have all the smart contracts on like a single chain, and then it's pretty easy for me to, you know, create some other application that like uses the different chains. And then another, another aspects of this that has been often brought up as like, okay, this is like a, you know, really core advantage is that I can make, you know, a transaction that interacts with different blockchains and uh, or different smart contracts. And, you know, either the whole transaction succeeds or it fails. Uh, so this like atomic transactions and, and flash loans on Ethereum, right? It's like this, this paradigm example where flash loans basically allow you to kind of borrow money, like use the money in a bunch of transactions and like repay the money like in the same transaction, uh, in the same block, 
So then I basically, you know, there's like no capital risk, right? The, the money is basically almost like instantaneously taken and given back. And uh, of course, that's like pretty unique and kind of strange use case. So yeah, how, how is that going to change? Like, do you think these atomic transactions, is, is that something that's like that important? Or how, how is that going to play out in a, in a sort of Axelar cross-chain context? I think, you know, before maybe we, we we just answer that, I think just taking a slight step back, I think it's it's kind of important to understand that it's sort of inevitable that applications, you know, and sort of cross-chain will have to be a reality to just continue scaling the ecosystem, right? Because why aren't we build, continuing building all on, on top of Ethereum, right? Well, you know, because it's, it's one network, it's one database, and it's congested, period, right? Um, and I think... If you look at a lot of other blockchains, no matter how much you serve, you know, throughput they process, um, however fast they are, if it's a single database, if it's a single network, at some point it's going to be congested once you're talking about, you know, even a handful of major applications that need, you know, thousands of transactions of throughput running on top of it, right? So in, in some sense, to continue scaling the ecosystem and to continue, you know, surviving, like, we're going to have to have more networks. Um, so I think that's inevitable. But then in that model, um, you know, you ask, well, how do I talk to to one another, right? Then, uh, and I think, like I mentioned, the the model changes were instead of having a transaction that may be, you know, atomic whenever you execute it in a single programming environment, you will be interacting in a more of a message passing way. This is similar to how. A lot of the networks uh, on the internet, again, right, and the traditional Web2 applications have scaled. They all run behind different networks or different database instances in the back end, right, and they send messages to exchange to one another. And we have protocols for reliably sending messages, unreliably sending messages, right, and then you build your application logic around those messages that tells you what to do when you know, the message hasn't arrived, right? Or it needs to be retransmitted. Um, or, you know, in this case, it would be what to do when the transaction doesn't go through, right? Or, you know, the asset is not delivered on the destination chain or whatever the swap that you want to do on the destination chain doesn't go through. What do you want to do with it? Um, you're going to have to put some some code in around it and you're going to have to put some rules, right? And that's where I think this layer of kind of application layer protocols will have to be built to you know, to almost think about like, what are some of the good examples and use cases that we want to have with stronger properties that, you know, just the message passing, right? Like, do you want to revert transactions across different networks? Do you want to um, allow people to, uh, you know, retransmit and replay and like, what types of fallback mechanisms that you have, you want to have, those are all kind of application specific cases that you have to think through. Um, but, you know, I don't think it's that hard. Um, well, it, it's, not, it's not trivial, we have to think through it, but it is a solvable problem and we have solved it in the past. And, um, you know, in this case, um, I think, yeah, it's inevitable that we're going to need this. And, uh, you know, and I, and I think in some sense, it's never ruled that uh, developers will have to adjust to this uh, programming environment along the way. Do you think, is, is there, have you thought about the idea of where, like whether Axelog could provide some kind of like atomic transaction guarantees across chains so that like, you know, I can, I can make a transaction on chain A and I want a transaction on chain B and like, you know, I only want the transaction on chain A to execute if I, if also the transaction on chain B executes. What, what are your thoughts on that? I, I, I think it's a great question. So uh, we have we have thought about it, and uh, you know it is possible. And I and I think this is where I think one of the architecture decisions that we made for building Axel becomes you know pretty fundamental and necessary in some senses because Axel itself runs on top of uh, you know consensus and a, a blockchain system right around Cosmos SDK. So that means that whatever cross chain transactions you want to execute, you can sequence them right on the axle network itself right and then you can build your protocols around it and you can say um you know because there is a sequence of events uh and because you can rely on the axle network to give you the sort of ordering of the transactions that need to be executed across different chains you can then execute them in a you know in a specific order and only trigger uh you know if and only if some other conditions have been satisfied 
if you were, you know, in contrast, if you were to work uh, and try to satisfy this without survey a consensus layer in the middle, right, or without an ordering service, um, this becomes a lot harder, right? You would have to um, you 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 would have to replicate a lot of this functionality at the application layer, um, which uh, you know is, is pretty painful to do. Yeah, it's 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 a very interesting uh, topic, and I, there was actually two podcasts I did just in the last like weeks where we kind of talked about this, and you know, one was with Dean Tribble of uh, Agoric, and he made the interesting claim that I don't think I'd heard before, but he kind of made the claim that like, okay, if you have actually these different chains, and if you don't have these like atomic actions across chain, that that actually leads to a much more kind of, you know, robust ecosystem because uh, the, the risks and the failure modes are more contained, you know, you'll have like, okay, something goes wrong and uh, but so there's sort of, you know, a little bit of an isolation of that. Do you see that as well? Or like, Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting point. I would have to think a little bit about it. Um, it is definitely, I guess, easier to build systems in that way, right? <laughs> Where, you know, you have like this asynchronous model and then, uh, you know, if one system goes down, you know, you can continue operating the other models. Um, you know, is, is this sufficient for applications that I'm not sure then I think we'll have to think but but again I think from a systems perspective I do think that that's the way you know we're going to have to build things in some sense um, but I do think you can build you know application layer protocols on top of it that serve you know some specific needs um, whenever you need to satisfy some of these you know atomic operations but on the network layer or interoperability layer in some sense it needs to be um, a little bit more decoupled and loose for, for these reasons right where if one network or one system goes down, like you can't take down everybody else, right? Like you have to isolate it and you have to contain the damage in some sense. Yeah. Yeah, and the other, let me just also mention it briefly because I just did the episode yesterday with the near guys. And this was also something that like we discussed a little bit and I was not aware of that before, but right on near you have like different shards. And then even if you have like two smart contracts that are on the same shard, they actually still don't, they still function this asynchronous way, right? Where you don't have this atomic transactions and they were like, okay, that's sort of their design choice so that the developer doesn't actually have to care about which shards the thing is in, and then the contract can be moved around and it like doesn't really change anything. But then of course it also, also has that implication that you know, it functions in this different way. So I, I, I thought this was very interesting because maybe in the past, maybe this is also something that the Ethereum community has like emphasized so much about like, oh, this is so crucial. This is so crucial because it was, uh, may, maybe that's not really the case. I, I, like, I think, you know, back to uh, what I was saying earlier, I think, you know, Nier, right, and Dean and Agora guys, they thought about how to scale the ecosystem, you know, for years to come, right? And I think they quickly realized that the only way to scale it is to continue, you know, sharding, right, or scaling horizontally in some sense. And whenever you scale in horizontally through many shards or many blockchains or whatever that, um, you know, architecture that you choose, you're going to have to switch to this uh, asynchronous communication model. Right. Um, so I think, you know, that's probably, I would say, one of the reasons those guys are uh, embracing this model, because it's, you know, it's sort of inevitable. Maybe talk us through a bit, like, what's the, uh, what's the status of Axlar today? Like, what has been developed? And yeah, like, what's... Yeah, so, you know, we spent a little over a year, uh, I think, to date, kind of a building the core networking technology. Um, we've run been running you know test nets for over eight months with our community and uh, you know last month we just announced that we're starting a phase rollout of the main network so that means that you know in the first phase we already started to onboard uh, you know early validators um getting them connected with different ecosystems i think we're already connected uh, i think six or seven different ecosystems uh through axler um and uh, we're slowly going to be opening up different functionalities on top of the network, right? Um, we already opened up uh, functionality to transfer some assets uh, so you can move 
things like Luna or UST across many EVM different ecosystems um, through uh, kind of front end application that we build on top of it. Um, and, uh, you know, the coming year is going to be pretty exciting as we're going to continue open up these functionalities, working with developers and working with the community to uh, start scaling this. Right. And, uh, you know, along the way, we'll have to build better documentation, better APIs, you know, SDKs. Think about those application layer protocols that we we'll want to that we we'll want to work with uh, with our partners um, and, you know, what ecosystems will continue um, integrating down the line. So super excited, I think, for the for the coming year. So one one interesting question I have. So you know, like let's say now we have like chain A and it, like you made the example, right? So you have UST, right, which is the stable coin that originates on Terra, and then you have some EVM chain, let's say Avalanche, and you want to like use it on there, and then you know Axlar is like a solution. That so that somebody can move it over, but of course Axlar is also its own blockchain. So do you do you think like what what kind of things do you see like running on the Axlar chain itself? Do do you ever see, for example, people developing like I don't know, let's say putting something like a permissionless Cosm Wasm in there or general smart contracting environment or like yeah, like what what kind of functionality can the axlar chain you know can be put in there in the future yeah great question so you know i think the core problem that we're trying to solve is interoperability right so and the way we want to see the future is that developers get to decide where they want to build, how they want to build, but underneath it, they have a set of protocols, you know, and infrastructure they can rely on to go cross chain, right? So this is our ultimate goal. Uh, so in that model, right, like we want to build the infrastructure and stack where developers are empowered to go and build, you know, on EVM chains, right, on Cosmos based chains, on whatever they they really want, and you know, and Axel just helps them to uh, communicate and go cross chain and be, um, you know, a service provider network in some sense that they can they can do those things. Um, on top of the Axel network itself, would developers be able to build? Uh, you can certainly build uh, some things, and uh, you know, I think we may open up uh, kind of Cosmosm for the purposes that we wanted to customize some of the application layer interoperability protocols uh, and things like that down the line and allow people to onboard new chains easier. Um, right now, if you want to onboard the new chain, you know, if it's an EVM chain, like we we'll build it so like you can onboard in 10 minutes. So it's pretty straightforward for Bitcoin. We have a module that we're working on um, for Cosmos, you know, it's IBC compatible. So it's kind of integrated at the protocol layer. Um, for other chains, you may need to push another module, but uh, you know we want to make it easier so that uh, you know maybe as a developer you can just write another smart contract that allows you to translate this message from a particular ecosystem to be routed by the Axel network with all the other networks that are connected with, right? Uh, without having to write like a full Cosmos module and pass a governance proposal down the line and things like that. Um, but on its own, kind of solving interoperability and cross-chain messages is just a such a demanding requirement and, uh, you know, you need a lot of throughput, you need to optimize for this use case. And, you know, we're designing Axel Network to kind of optimize for this use case uh, as opposed to as a, you know, as another, uh, you know, developer environment. I think there's a lot of projects where optimize for, you know, JavaScript development or Solidity development or, you know, Rust development. And I think there a lot of them are doing a fantastic job. So we want to, you know, connect those ecosystems um, on the actual network itself will already process in, you know, tens of thousands of transactions per day just for cross-chain message passing. I wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, start building the application on that. And uh, I think we want to remain as a service provider in some sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, what, one application is that, you know, we've had a bunch of conversations on, it's kind of like an interesting, I think, um, sort of product. On Ethereum, you have something like Gnosis Safe, right? Which is this smart contract wallet. And, you know, that's pretty nice because you can have, you know, multi-sig, you can have, uh, you know, maybe some sort of programmability. You can have like different types of things, but, you know, it's an Ethereum thing. It doesn't function cross-chain. And in general, like, you know, cross-chain wallets don't, 
I mean, there's no great solution, right? There's not like one wallet you can use across like different ecosystems. You have, you know, on Cosmos, you have something like Kepler. Okay, functions great on Cosmos chains, but like doesn't function anywhere else. Solana, you have Phantom, great over there, but like doesn't really do much else. You know, Ethereum, you have a MetaMask. And so this, this idea of like, okay, can you have like some kind of universal programmable wallet? And of course, I guess one way of doing that might be that you have actually like a chain or, or some place that custodies assets on all these different chains. And then, you know, I could just have one private key uh, on that chain and I send a message to that chain and then that emits like uh, transactions on another chain to like, you know, for example, stake Ethereum or, or like, you know, swap Ethereum on Uniswap. But like, it, so there's like an interesting, I think an interesting kind of product idea. How, have you thought about this? And how, how do you see that sort of playing with the Axelor stack? Yeah, no, I think uh, kind of a building universal cross-chain wallets, you know, is is one of the top, I think, use cases of interoperability, right? And it kind of goes back to the things we talked about earlier is that, you know, allowing users to interact with all of these ecosystems and dApps in an easy way from a single wallet, right? Um, and I think the way that this, um, you know, will play out is that you do need a combination of I guess, asset transfer and message passing to make those universal wallets, right? And I think, you know, it seems like you already have some great design ideas, Brian, right? But, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, if I were to envisage it, it's sort of similar, right? Where you have um, potentially some smart contracts that are living on different chains, where as a user, you know, you're authorized to interact with those smart contracts, right? And those contracts allow you to have your balances, you know, on different ecosystems, uh, maybe even, um, the way people send money to you is through, you know, a universal um, like handle and that, uh, you know, can be used to uniquely identify you, right? Or universal identifier, QR codes, whatever you want. Um, and then underneath it, the, the wallet providers or the dApps um, and the user, they get to interact with those contracts, shuffle liquidity back and forth if they needs to be, shuffle messages if they, if they need to be. And, uh, you know, all of that experience is a lot smoother. So... I, I think it's a great example, and I do think we're going to see something like this start appearing over the coming years. Yeah, I mean, I guess one, one I don't know if that, one way one could build it maybe, right, might be as a Cosmos chain, and then you could you could maybe use IBC to connect with other Cosmos chains and use something like Axelar to connect with, like, the rest of the blockchain universe, but who knows, I mean... Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and in that case, I think, um, you know, you can build it like on, on the Cosmos, right? And then kind of use the IBC Axelor stack to talk to other networks. Uh, similarly, you can build your logic wherever you want, right? Like you can you, you can build it like on Avalanche or Solana if you want. And then again, you know, use like the Axelor protocol uh, to send messages to other ecosystems, right? So, so in that sense, as a developer of that wallet, this is really allows you to Pick wherever, wherever you want to host your logic, right? Which application layer logic where your core functionality is going to live, and then use the interoperability protocols to communicate and uh, you know interact with other ecosystems. So when you look to the future of Axlar, what are the hardest problems that are ahead? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's a combination of continuing to build technology, right, in a in a in an efficient way. Continue to integrate more chains, uh, more assets, uh, improving security along the way. Um, you know, reducing the gas costs, um, reducing latency, um, and uh, you know, working with a lot of the developers to to teach them uh, and to educate them. How do you? write applications in a cross-chain environment, right? How do you how do you think in this new uh, different paradigm of programming model? Yeah, so I, I think all of those things are, you know, um, challenges, but also that's where, you know, the rewards and opportunities are, right? Um, and, you know, to us, that's what's sort of the exciting, the exciting aspect of it is that we, we get to change the way um, the ecosystem can scale. Right? And I think it is quite, quite needed um, to continue growing. 
Can you talk also a little bit about, uh, you know, kind of like the roadmap uh, or, or, you know, like the, the rollouts that are coming? Uh, you know, you mentioned EVM chains, right? So I think there's like one of the initial focus on these EVM chains, like, yeah. So talk a little bit about like, you know, where's that at and like what comes afterwards and what, what would be, you know, kind of the, the ways people can actually interact with Axlar in, in the coming year. Yeah, so um, you know the initial rollout that we um, started doing focused on connection between Cosmos chains and EVM chains, right? So you know Cosmos chains we can easily onboard through IBC, kind of pretty straightforward. For EVM chains, we also program that uh, on the network layer, so you can onboard um, an EVM chain, you know, in, in ten or fifteen minutes, assuming the validator supported, right? So it's it's incredibly easy and uh, uh, very straightforward to do. And uh, you know we are continuing to work on a Bitcoin module that would allow to onboard uh, you know Bitcoin and similar types of proof of work uh, kind of legacy um, ecosystems. Um, and we're you know opening up the SDK and a set of APIs that would allow developers to interact and talk across all these different uh, chains, right? So this is something I'm pretty excited about um, right now. If you want to integrate and move assets back and forth. Um, there is a simple, uh, you know, JavaScript SDK that we're going to be releasing that allows you to do those uh, those calls in an, e in an easy way. You know, you can integrate like bridging functionalities in your DEX or your DeFi application. Um, but then from there, we're going to uh, enable this SDK that will allow you to talk directly to the gateway contracts, right? Or directly from your DAP front end and talk with other ecosystems. So that's something we'll be um, starting to roll out soon. And um, that's how we envisage most of the developers will interact with Axler and other ecosystems. Well, thanks so much, Sergey. It's been really a pleasure to like have you on to like learn about Axler and, and kind of share this with our audience. And I think it's been, it's been exciting to like follow along and I'm, I'm, I'm super, yeah, excited to see see how it evolves. I mean, I, I think for me, what, what has actually been interesting about interoperability was that when like IBC launched, I was really surprised how good the user experience was. And, and of course that's still pretty limited, right? Because it's just, uh, it's just Cosmos, right? It doesn't really work well. And then it gets much worse when you have uh, like, let's say interoperability between different, I don't know, because often you have different wallets on each side and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm excited about, you know, what things like Axlar will enable by having this like smooth, seamless interoperability across chains. Cause I think mean, it's just going to be enormous, like what that enables. Yeah, for sure. Well, it was great chatting, Brian, and thanks for all the questions. Uh, always a pleasure chatting with you. Cool. Thanks.